Hello everybody. Welcome to the library. Can you figure out what I'm thinking about today? Look at the books behind me. I'm thinking about science. And science is a great subject for people of all ages to study. And a great place to find out more about science is from books. Look at the ones behind me. This one right here is called I Fall Down. It's fairly simple, but it's got some good experiments about gravity. If you're wanting to move on a little higher level, you might select this book, The Sky's the Limit, Stories of Discovery by Women and Girls. And if you really want to delve deeper, maybe grades five and up, you might select the book back here, Joy Hakim's The Story of Science. It has a lot about different scientists and their discoveries and how they discovered these things. Did you see the experiment I did at the beginning of the video? What law of motion did it demonstrate? And who do we credit for that law of motion? Well, I'll give you a hint with the book I'd like to read you today. It's called Newton's Rainbow, The Revolutionary Discoveries of a Young Scientist. Now, we're not going to read the whole book because there's a whole lot of content, probably more than you would want to sit and listen to in one video. But let's turn to the title page. Newton's Rainbow by Catherine Lasky. Pictures by Kevin Hawkes. The story is that he was napping in the garden when an apple fell from a tree, bopping him on the head and boing! Isaac Newton began to develop the theory of gravitation. Here's what's true. There was a garden. There was an apple tree. The apple really did fall. Isaac was not asleep. He may have been thinking with his eyes closed. We might imagine that he was thinking about Kepler's laws of planetary motion, given what came next. But then again, he might have been thinking about what was for supper, or that it had been a week since his last bath. People didn't bathe much back then. No one knows for sure, and there were no witnesses. According to a 1752 book about Isaac's life, written by a friend, he was not actually hit on the head by an apple. The book says, rather, that the theory was occasioned by the fall of an apple. Isaac had been thinking about gravity for a long time, and what he thought when he saw the apple was, why doesn't that apple fall up or sideways? Why down? He wondered about the force that made it do this, and then he looked up into the sky. Perhaps, since it was afternoon, he saw only the faint outline of the moon, but he could imagine the night sky and all of the stars, and he wondered if such a force could stretch out into the heavens and account for the orbits of the planets around the sun and the moon around the earth. He began to understand that if the moon wasn't moving, it would most certainly crash into the earth like the apple. The questions unanswered by Kepler's laws of motion haunted him as he looked at this apple. There must be a force exerted on the moon, a force opposed to gravity that kept it in its orbit. He knew then that there must be rules of force that governed the planets and other bodies in motion. Isaac would begin to formulate these rules, which would be known as the laws of motion. Later, he would combine these laws with his own law of universal gravitation. Together, they became the basis for modern physics. But it was not only motion and gravity that concerned Isaac during that year in Woolsthorpe. People at the time believed that all light was white. Some even believed that colors were made by blending different tones of darkness with a white light. But Isaac wasn't sure. He wanted to explore the nature of light. He wanted to find out how it travels and what its ingredients really were. A year or so earlier, Isaac had gone to a country fair and bought a child's toy prism. He knew that when light passed through the prism, it broke up into colors of the rainbow. He also knew that when he looked through a telescope, he observed a halo of color that often made the star harder to see. He wondered why this happened. First, he took the prism into his bedroom and closed all the curtains and shutters so it was completely dark. Then he let a needle-thin beam of sunlight from outside shine into the room through a small hole in the window shutters and pass through the prism. All the colors of the rainbow played across the wall of his bedroom and always in the same order, red, orange, yellow, green, 
blue, indigo, violet. He next tried another experiment. This experiment used two pinholes and two prisms. The first pinhole was the one in the shutters. As before, light from the pinhole passed through the first prism. From that prism, all the colors refracted into a wooden board. This board had the second pinhole, allowing only one of the seven colors to pass through it to the second prism. People had long believed that it was the prism coloring the light, but Isaac's experiment proved that this was not true. For if it had been, all the colors would have returned after the light passed through the second prism. They did not. Isaac had shown that prisms did not color the light, and that light itself was composed of seven different colors. And if this wasn't proof enough, he tried one more experiment. This time he again used two prisms, but placed the second one upside down. Now the first prism split the beam of white light into seven separate colors, and the second prism brought them back together to make white light once more. Isaac had discovered the secret of the rainbow, and it was not a pot of gold at the end. A rainbow was the seven different colors of white light after passing through the tiny prisms formed by raindrops in the atmosphere. Isaac's Annus Mirabilis stretched into 18 months and included more accomplishments. Then, on the first night of September 1666, a fire broke out in a bakery in Pudding Lane in London. By the next morning, a wind had risen and the fire spread throughout the city. Fed by the crowded thatched roof wooden buildings, it became so intense that no one could get near it. For four days and four nights, the city burned, destroying over 13,000 houses and 87 churches including St. Paul's Cathedral. It jumped the Fleet River and threatened to consume the court of King Charles II at Whitehall. But finally, the wind died down, and the firefighters were successful in quenching the flames. There was one blessing that came with the fire. Not only were houses and other buildings destroyed, but the rats that carry the diseased fleas were destroyed as well. The plague was finally over. Six months later, Isaac returned to Trinity College at Cambridge University. Soon after returning to Trinity College, Isaac took the examinations that would determine his future. If he did well, he could become a fellow of the college and spend the rest of his life as a scholar at the university, studying, giving lectures, and helping students. That year there were only nine openings, so he would have to do exceedingly well. For four days, Isaac was asked to write and answer questions. On October 1st, a tolling bell summoned the candidates to the chapel, where they would learn their destiny. Newton was one of the nine chosen. He immediately went into the town of Cambridge and bought 12 yards of dark blue fabric, the color of Trinity Collar's scholar's gowns. Perhaps, since he was now a fellow with a guaranteed income, he felt he could expand his household items beyond the chamber pot, candles, ink, and notebook with which he had arrived. He bought a new bed, a tablecloth, and six napkins. For some reason, of all the colors of the rainbow that he had managed to splinter apart, he became obsessed with crimson, a deep shade of red. In an uncharacteristic splurge, he bought new cushions, a bedspread, curtains, and carpets in his favorite color. For the rest of his life, he would surround himself with color, but it was usually crimson. Isaac Newton lived to the age of 84, but he never became an especially sociable man. He never married, and he had few friends. He lived in his imagination and dared to test the things he imagined through experiment. To further explore his theories of color of the color spectrum, he blew soap bubbles through a clay pipe and began to grasp how, when light fell on the bubble, the thin film of the soap functioned as a kind of liquid prism. And if he was not blowing bubbles, he was figuring out mathematical solutions for elliptical paths of the planets. In truth, Newton had figured out the solution for this problem many years earlier, but he had lost the papers with his calculations. It was only when Edmund Haley, the famous astronomer, begged him to write, down, write it down that he finally explained it in a nine-page document written in Latin, the language used by scholars in their writings at that time. Newton did not like to share his ideas. He guarded them as a miser might guard his pile of gold. Yet, for all his cantankerousness, he was generous in giving credit to others. However, his generosity for the most part extended to scientists who were really dead, like Galileo and Kepler. When asked how he could see and understand things that others could not, he would reply, 
If I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants before me. And it was on the shoulders of Isaac Newton that future scientists, including the greatest scientists of the 20th century, Albert Einstein, would perch to peer beyond the secrets of the rainbow to those of space and time and the very origins of our universe. I hope you enjoyed hearing the second half of that book and learning more about Sir Isaac Newton. And he did describe three laws of motion. And the first one, second, and third are all learned by uh, students of science in elementary school. So my challenge to you is, which of Newton's laws of motion was demonstrated at the beginning of this video? Then take some of that knowledge and see how you can apply it. Can you use the same law? Can you demonstrate it in a different way? Think about it. If you come up with something good, let me know and share it with me. Thanks for spending time with me today. Goodbye. See you next time in the library.